church, let's tonight grab our Bibles and turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 13 in our study tonight. Matthew 13, you guys ready for this? Um, we're in the parable series, and it's pretty fresh. As uh, I think now we're in our third parable. We've got uh, many more to do. But uh, tonight we are in the parable, the famous parable. <laughs> like one of them are not famous. But this one's very popular. And that is the parable of the mustard seed. And um, I think we'll have some fun with this tonight. It's rather encouraging. But um, I'm going to ask you to take notes tonight. Either write uh, in your Bible a lot. I'm a big fan of that. Some people will say, you know, you shouldn't write in your Bible. You know, it's, it's sacrilegious to write in your Bible. We don't worship. We don't worship and we don't have to worship the piece of paper and the leather-bound book that we own. If it gets stolen or uh, gets, uh, falls into the ocean or something, we just go buy a new one. You understand that? Um, what we do need to do, though, is take this word and hide it in our hearts. That's where it takes on power. Uh, it is the power of God. It is the eternal word of God. But until it is in our hearts and activated, uh, we are, in some regards, spectators uh, to the word of God. And I think you're a church that refuses to be spectators to the word of God. And I'm grateful for that. And so as we look at these parables... They are designed by Jesus to accomplish several things. They are powerful. And you've been learning how they are a mode of teaching that God employs. Because look, he made the human mind and heart. And a parabolic way of teaching or parables is unlike any other. It is genius. It is brilliant. It is designed by God to reach us to the very core of who we are. And you've learned by now in our studies that when Jesus throws out a parable, remember that, and I told you to keep this in mind, parabolos, or parable, is to cast truth alongside the heart or the mind. Parable, Jesus throws out a parable, so he verbally is casting truth wrapped in a package that has amazing effect. It is a um, information bomb that lands alongside someone's head. In a sense, a bomb goes off and someone sees the truth that Jesus is trying to communicate with technicolor brilliance, okay? Boom, the light comes on. I got it. And we would say today it's, it's uh, being done by an illustrator. You know how that happens. Um, where it's painted, the picture. We love pictures. We love paintings. And rightfully so, uh, that a picture, you know, is worth a thousand words. Why? Because it so stimulates the mind. A parable is a construction of words using a common thing around you that everybody knows about. Keep that in mind. Everybody knows about it. And Jesus drops it in such a way that for those hearts who are open, it explodes with greater reality. To hearts that are closed against Jesus or hearts that aren't open to have him in their lives, that very same bomb that goes off, instead of illuminating them, it winds up, as it were, having them be set in their opposition to God. A parable is an extremely powerful tool. And we're going to come to one of those things tonight that is awesome. Every parable, write this down in your notes if you care to, every parable given by God is to have multiple meanings, uh, to unlock or to seal up. It is given to encourage and to challenge. It is given to um, help you and to others who are closed, uh, to condemn them. It illuminates those that, are, that want to see more light, and it brings darkness upon those who don't care to know. It has a positive, and it has a negative, all based upon where your heart is. That's why it's vital in this series that we pay very close attention to what he's saying. The parable of the mustard seed. Matthew 13, look at verse 31. And 32, very short teaching, very powerful parable. Another parable he put forth to them saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field. Verse 32, which indeed is the least of all the seeds, 
But when it is grown, it is greater than the herbs and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. Note takers, mark this down. This uh, account is also recorded in Mark's gospel, chapter 4, verse 30, and Luke chapter 13, verse 18. Three places here in Matthew as well. Three places it's given. Why? Because God is making a statement that we better get this. This is a big deal. And these parables are repeated in other places in the gospel. But this extremely powerful thing that he's delivering, this one, like all others, has a warning and it has an encouragement. I want you to keep that in your mind. A little bit of background would be good uh, for us uh, regarding this. This series of teachings of these parables Jesus gave in the north of Israel. How many of you have been to Israel? Raise your hand. That's a good crowd. Um, we'll, be, we'll be there again soon. And why don't you guys put the first picture up on the screen? Um, it's great for you to know this. Now, this is the Galilee region, and you can see the Golan Heights. That's across uh, the Galilee over there. Uh, Jordan and Syria on the other side of those, those hills. But uh, does that look a little familiar right now? Those of you who live in Chino Hills or... <laughs> You're Belinda. Uh, if you drive down the 15 freeway right now and you go by Lake Elsinore, this time of the year looks exactly the same. Truly it does. Uh, it's amazing. It's very beautiful. And these parabolic teachings Jesus gave uh, at the Sea of Galilee. Most scholars believe it was probably near or at uh, a place called Tabka. Now, you may not have heard of the place Tabka unless you've been to Israel, but it's the place where uh, Jesus, do you remember after the resurrection, uh, the disciples were in a boat and Peter saw Jesus cooking fish on the shore and he jumped out of the boat and swam to Jesus? That's the location of Tabka. I think we have another slide here uh, to look at. Look at the gorgeous, don't you? Lo I love that. Now, again, those of you who have been with us, um, that kind of a steep cliff near the edge, and then there's green back there. Tiberius is back there. That's where your hotel is at. And uh, it's just gorgeous. I have to tell you, on the right side, do you see those palm trees right by there? Uh, there is an awesome Arab uh, restaurant right there. Uh, it's really a great place. I've eaten there several times. Lisa and I have been. Usually when we tuck the team into bed or get them at their hotel <laughs> right here, Lisa and I have to go to this spot once a year. And it is an awesome place, and everybody in there has got turbans or hijabs or burqas on. And then there's two uh, Americans there with tennis shoes and t-shirts on. That would be Lisa and I. And they just have the most amazing food. Why is it amazing? Because everything on the table, everything on, on uh, the plates is all from this region. This is an amazing part of the world, church. That water level that you're seeing right there is 700 feet below sea level. The Sea of Galilee is 700 feet below sea level. And the amazing thing about it is it's almost always warm there. And it's in a volcanic region. The great Transjordan Rift is what causes the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea and that area of uh, the Red Sea down by Elat to be what it is. There's a massive earthquake fault and it has volcanic uh, characteristics to it, so the soil is extremely fertile. That's why Israel today is the fruit and vegetable basket of Europe and much of the world uh, in that uh, region of the world for Russia and other areas. There's no other place like it on earth except the central California Valley. It's really remarkable. It's absolutely amazing. And when you go there, in fact, I wrote some things down. I kind of know these by heart, but I don't want to miss any, and I'm not even hitting on all of them. You'll get in your car, you'll be in the tour with us, and you'll drive around, and you will see the largest collection of bananas you've ever seen in your life. More than I've seen in Hawaii. Bananas in Israel. Papayas. Oranges. Lemons. Limes. Pecans. Avocados. Almonds. Figs. Guava. Just nonstop. Why? Because things grow there because of the climate and because of the soil. They just explode there. Why am I telling you all this? Because the next two photos do not give 
uh, the parable justice. Look at these two next photos of what we here in California would call dill, right? You've seen this. In fact, very soon you're going to see this growing all over our hills, okay? Um, mustard seed. It's interesting. Listen to this. When the Bible here says that, and Jesus is saying, there's no smaller seed than the mustard seed, those of you who know botany would stand up and say, wait a minute, Jesus is wrong. I think, isn't, isn't the orchid seed one of the smallest, if not the smallest seed? That's true. Oh, Jesus, there's a, there's, there's a mistake in the Bible. Hold on. The mustard seed, God is so good, and Jesus being God, he made the mustard seed. He knows what he's talking about. The mustard seed is the smallest seed of all those in the herb family. He knows his stuff. <laughs> he didn't say, he didn't use uh, orchid. He used mustard seed. Why is that? Because the mustard seed in Israel is unlike any other mustard seed in the entire world. Don't compare mustard seed uh, or mustard seed plant that we grow here to what they grow there. The Jewish Mishnah, uh, historians, uh, past and botanist today, make mention of the mustard seed shrub that grows in Israel in parts of the eastern side of the Mediterranean that they grow somewhere between 9 and 12 feet high. Some have been as high as 16 feet high, whereby some historians have ridden, it says in their writings, horses, men on horseback have ridden underneath mustard seed shrubs. They're not trees, but shrubs. But they look like, or they take on the appearance of a tree. That blows our minds. We don't understand that. But we need to keep that in mind. What Jesus is speaking about is so specifically accurate to the land and to the very parable that he's going to be teaching us about tonight because it is so, so vitally important. He's going to be talking about the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. Remember that, it's interchangeable. What is the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God? It is the body of believers in the context of the New Testament, the church. The kingdom of heaven. In fact, Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is what is within you. That is, faith stems or grows or begins within you. That's where the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven originates. And we want to keep that in mind. And so as I mentioned, this amazing, incredible, tree-looking shrub. I want you to just keep that in your mind now as we get into this. Jesus' teaching is in technicolor regarding tremendous truth. I want to give you two verses before we get into the study tonight. It's very important. In Luke chapter 8, verse 18, Jesus said, therefore, take heed how you hear. Okay? Lisa will say to me, are you listening? And I said, oh, yeah, that's a terrifying question. <laughs> are you listening? Jesus says, take heed how you hear. So think of that. How are you hearing? How are you hearing? And then, again, he says in Mark 4, 24, then Jesus said to them, take heed what you hear. So be careful what you hear and be careful how you hear it. Be careful what you allow into your heart and into your ears and into your mind. Boy, do we need this counsel today in our words? And be careful how you hear it. The how speaks about what we would say today, spin. What you're listening to, there's a spin to it. The world will say something to you and then try to get it into you. And they'll dress it up. They'll, they'll tantalize it. They'll, they'll say things like, in fact, if you notice every year, just before Christmas, it's all uh, starts in October, heavily in uh, November and December, about how rotten your car is and how much you need to buy a new one. Have you noticed that? All these amazing commercials about uh, you need to trade your car in, and you're all, discon you're all discontented now. You're all uh, bummed about your car. What are they doing? They're taking something, and they're spinning it to try to make it uh, a treat to you, 
to take it. And when Jesus says, be careful what and how you hear, he's describing the effect of a parable laid alongside your heart. Be careful or pay attention what you hear and how you hear it. What you take in and how you process it. This is vitally important. So point number one, mark this down if you would. It is this, the mustard seed parable. First thing we learn right here, number one, is uh, small beginnings. Obviously, Jesus is speaking about small beginnings, and how does that apply to us in our lives? When he says that another parable uh, he put forth to them, uh, Matthew 13, 31, the kingdom of heaven is like, so here's a similitude, a type. This is what the church is going to be like for the next 2,000 years. It's going to be like a mustard seed. And if you just stopped at that comma, that's not very encouraging. He's talking to the disciples. And right then they would have went like this. They, they honestly, watch, watch me. He would have been speaking to them and they, they would have went, what? That's it? Actually, they, they would have gone, that's it? Oy vey. That's, that's not very encouraging. But he's not done. The kingdom of heaven. The work of God. Imagine, the work of God in you is like a mustard seed. Oh, what a letdown that is. <laughs> the smallest little thing? The smallest thing. <laughs> which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all the seeds or herbs, the seeds of herbs. Jesus here uses what is called this hyperbolic teaching, technicolor teaching, but it's taking something that's very common to them, and he's going to go somewhere with it and blow it up in front of them, but it's going to be a great application. By the way, we use that today, the same kind of teaching, uh, things like this. Uh, this book weighs a ton. You see kids walking, oh man, that book weighs a ton, or the mosquitoes are a size of birds there. Well, they're not really, and it's not even considered a lie, what you just said. It is like a, a hyperbolic presentation. Oh man, the sun was scorching us. Well, it wasn't really. But you see what I'm saying? So now they're listening. It's like, oh my goodness, a mustard seed. He's got their attention, but for them right now, it is like, really? That's not, that's not that good of a deal so far. But you've got our attention. He's going to be stressing to them what the kingdom of God is like in its beginnings. Small, but he's not going to leave it there. It's amazing to think, when you think about it, that the very nature of the church has been that of growth. So Jesus, in his very putting forth of it, is saying, hey, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, the church age is like this. It starts out like a mustard seed. Can't start any smaller than that. And he looked around. Can you imagine looking around? There's 12 guys standing there. Isn't it amazing? Tonight, you're sitting there as a Christian because 12 guys were paying attention. Isn't that wild? How did you get saved? Where did you get saved? When did that happen? Listen, it's all because the Holy Spirit started a work in Jerusalem and in Israel 2,000 years ago. Isn't that wild? I mean, yeah, think about that for a while. It's awesome to think. Isn't Jesus' words coming true even as we sit here? Have you shared Christ with anybody? Have you ever prayed to have someone accept Jesus? Mustard seed growing. It's absolutely awesome. To the point now where you think about it, from very little beginnings of being insignificant and small and unaffected, the church has grown. Even today where all around the world in the most backward or dangerous or most developed or the dark jungles of South America, the gospel is going. It's absolutely awesome. No wonder why Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18, on this rock, I will build my church. I love that. I will build my church and the gates of hell will not, will not, will not prevail against it. Jesus said that. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. That's very encouraging. In Matthew 17, 20, while we're picking on this mustard seed concept, though this verse doesn't exactly play into the parable for sure, but Matthew 17, 20, you all know this. You've probably thought about it tonight. Jesus said, I say unto you, if you have the faith of a mustard seed, right, you can say to this or that 
be moved or be cast into the sea. What is he saying? That within you, Christian, faith begins and the smallest amount of faith, and I like this, listen everybody, the smallest amount of faith, when it starts, please hear me, when it starts, it refuses to um, stay at that level of flame. Faith can't, faith refuses to stay a spark. It may start as a spark, but faith, as it begins to consume, like any good fire does, the fuel around it, it demands more. That's why those of you who have stepped out, terrified, I understand that, uh, knees shaking, or you know your hands are shaking, your nerves are shaking, but you step out and you follow Jesus and you do that thing, or you or you go that way or you whatever it is but you take that step of faith and you're terrified on the outside but you know I got to do this and the moment you do that and you see God come in and take care of the situation or bear you up or God uses you in that moment you made yourself open God uses you and there's an amazing thing I'm sorry for this uh, word I'm about to use because I can't think of any other but as soon as you get that rush you have to have that fix more. You're using drug terminology. I know I am. What the world is using drugs to try to achieve, the Christian can have for free, and it never fades. It just, he just winds up saying, come on, you want more of that? You want more of that? Okay, then you know what? Then go pray for that guy right there. You want more of that? You want more of me? Okay, then get up and tell that person about me. It is absolutely awesome. It's terrifying, you get dry mouth, your nerves are shaking, and you step out. And I don't know about you, but the more dry mouth you have and the more you're shaking, the more you ought to expect God to be very big in that moment. Look, if you showed up and said, hey, I got it, I got it. Back off, everybody. Holy Spirit, you can take a seat. I got it. I got it. Here I go. And let me, boom, you're going down. Pride comes before fall. I'd rather be shaking in my boots and have the power of God than, uh, you know, have some fleshly thing behind it and say, I can do this. Man, that's dangerous. Small beginnings. Don't despise small beginnings. The Bible says in Zechariah 4.10, do not despise these small beginnings. Maybe you're just venturing out in faith. You're a brand new Christian. I talked to a guy the other, uh, last Sunday. He's been a Christian for years, but he started coming to church, and he's, he said, I've heard more Bible in three weeks than I've had in the 30 years of the church I just came from. That's scary, huh? And he's so excited. Why is he excited? Bible. His soul is out of its coma, and now it's eating. Think about that. And what's happening? He's, he had a small beginning. Look, he had a small beginning, but watch now. Watch, watch, the, watch, watch what happens in this person's life. It's amazing. Unfortunately, a lot of Christians start out on a venture of faith, and I don't know, but if they might become uh, disillusioned or they lose their motivation, I don't know, but um, I want you to think about this for a moment. When, when, when we look at this as small beginnings, this little mustard seed beginning, Jesus is obviously speaking about the church, but the church is made up of people. It's not a building. It's the people. And listen, we can start out on a venture that requires faith, but we need to make sure that our motives are right. And that would be, first of all, to glorify God. Amen. I want to glorify God in my life. Or I, I want to I see people strengthened for the kingdom's sake. And if you keep that your focus, even through the small things, think about that. If, you, if your vision and purpose and desire, which I hope it is, is to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ, honor the word of God, and minister to his people, you know what? It literally will not matter if you've got 10 people under uh, you or around you or 10,000 people around. It doesn't, the number will never matter. But listen, when you lose that Jesus-centered ministry 
mind, you will despise the day of small things. You'll be bummed, oh man, there's only three people coming to this, that, or we called this meeting and only one person came or whatever. Listen, God never, never starts out with big numbers. I've never seen God start out with big numbers in any capacity. War, spiritual things, he loves He loves the setting. Remember Gideon's army? He had tens of thousands of guys. They show up for battle. God goes, okay, all right. Everyone's like, you know, men do that war chant. We're ready to kill. God goes, oh, stop. Got a problem. We got too many guys. Too many guys? We're going to war. We need all the guys that we can get. No, Gideon, you got to send some of these guys home. Send them home. And he wound, up having, he wound up having just a handful of guys, man. Just a couple hundred people. Who is that? And God says, okay, now. Now I can use this. Translation. After these guys whipped that big army over there, everybody, including those that got whipped, are going to know that there's a God in heaven. Yeah. And if your heart goes, yeah, that's what I want, then you'll be excited about the days of small things. Jesus says, the kingdom starts out like that. And maybe your faith is little tonight. It won't stay little. If you're a Christian tonight and you have faith in God tonight, I'm just going to tell you, get a mouthpiece, put it in your mouth, get a helmet on, strap it on. You get brinks, elbow pads if you want. But Christianity is radical. It's awesome. Well, mine's not. Well, you're doing it wrong then. And it's going to be wild. That's how God's glorified. If it's all predictable, if it's all easy, if it's all smooth, honestly, I love you, but God's probably not in it. It's a scary day when we begin to coast. That would be momentum carrying us down the track rather than the power of the Holy Spirit. So you and I, in a sense, regarding this parable, we're like it in miniature. And that is that we need to be growing. And so none of us tonight should have an excuse. Well, you know, I'm so small. I'm so insignificant. My faith is so little. No, don't don't do that. In fact, listen to this. I love this verse. Mark it down. It removes all excuses from us. It's great. 1 Corinthians 1.26 begins there when Paul says, For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh. Isn't that funny? God calls not many wise people, not many mighty, not many noble. The word is blue bloods. Not many uh, kings and queens are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. That's, that's the definition of a Christian. <laughs> What's a Christian? A foolish thing in the world. (laughs) And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen. You see, you you and I have no excuse now. We qualify. (laughs) And the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are. That no flesh should glory in his presence. Wow. <laughs> I love it. That's why, next verse, Acts 1.8. We have no place to hide with our excuses. Why? Acts 1.8, just before Jesus went back to heaven, he told the disciples what was going to be the catalyst. Listen, can I put it this way? What would be the catalyst to the mustard seed? What would really cause it to grow? Well, it's the Holy Spirit using the word of God in the life of a believer, okay? But what happens? Acts 1.8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Not in you. He's already talking to believers. The Holy Spirit who already dwells within them will come upon them. Listen, some of you have come from other denominational persuasions. You've been told that the moment you accepted Christ... You received the Holy Spirit, which you did, and that's it. But that's not true. 
The Holy Spirit comes inside the believer at the moment of conversion. He comes inside you. The word in Greek is en. It means to come inside. Once and for all, he does that. Did you hear me, everybody? Some of you might be thinking, well, I accepted Christ last week, but I can't wait for Sunday. I'm going to accept Christ again. You don't need to do that. Okay, you may have had a rough week, and there's things you need to repent of, but that's between you and God. He's in you. What you want now is EPI, epi. You want the Holy Spirit, as it's referenced here, to come upon you, completely different word. Use whatever terminology you want, I could care less. Come upon you, fill you up, baptize you in it, whatever, I don't care, blah, blah, blah. It's the power of God. Well, pastor, I keep falling into the same area of, of weakness to my flesh every day. You know, I, listen, and you will do that until you cry out to God and have the Holy Spirit's power come upon you that the next time that temptation comes, you just punch it right in the nose and walk on with Jesus. The power of the Holy Spirit is what brings you victory. So Jesus says, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes, epe, upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem. Notice how the, watch the mustard seed expand. And in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Just think about it. Right now, tonight, 2,000 years since Jesus said this, the sun never sets on the church on the earth today. It's everywhere. Point number two tonight is this regarding the mustard seed found in verse 32 is that it has a small beginning but a big ending. He says, but when it is grown, it is greater than the herbs and becomes a tree or resembles a tree. So watch this. Biblical scholars at this point argue from this moment on the meaning. And, and church, I'm going to give you some views. Um, I have my own view, but what, that doesn't do you any good. You, have, you, you study this on your own. Some scholars say this, that what Jesus now is about to teach is that uh, it is the expanse of the church and its influence in the world. Uh, it's, it's, so to speak, shining its light, right? And, and being salt, which is consistent with Scripture. And uh, it influences in various ways and forms the world. So the other group of scholars says, no, 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 no. It means that this is abnormal growth. This should not be happening. And what is going on here is that the growth is almost like a cancer or tumor, and it leads to a destruction if you keep reading the parable. And they have a good point there as well. And you'll find very, very good teachers throughout history that are completely opposite on the conclusion of where this parable lands. Are you with me? So what was right? Well, man, I hate to say this, but I think both sides are taking this to an extreme and missing the argument of the other side. Why? Because didn't Jesus in previous parables say, the kingdom of heaven's like this. A sower went out to sow seed, Right? And some seed fell upon, and he gives the three soils that, will, that turned out to be not good. Remember? Thorns and cares of the world and hard, hard impacted soil, and it produced nothing. But the fourth one did. The parabolic teaching of contrast to where there's good and bad. There's encouragement and a warning. You with me? And in each of the parables... You'll see that. What did we see last week? We saw the sower that went out to sow seed, and he sowed wheat, but tares grew up among the wheat. Remember? There's the good, and there's the not good. I think with what is called uh, expositional constancy, that is, Jesus is on a roll here in the context, what fits? I think this fits. It fits is growth that is massive supernatural growth, but with growth, what do you experience with growth? You experience difficulties with growth. What's one of the difficulties? 
we're going to be reading about birds that come and lodge in the branches. Do you remember, were you here for the previous studies? I hope you're not missing any. Shame, shame, shame. <laughs> birds generically spoken of without being referenced specifically in the New Testament's always a negative. Birds, general, not good. Sparrows, good. He mentions the bird by type. When he doesn't, generically, bad. Very interesting. So, as we read this, I think both camps are right, but they shouldn't exclude either one. I think we're seeing in consistency the challenge. So, let's look at it, first of all, as a word of encouragement. Big endings. The church will grow in an unimaginable ways throughout the world. Has that not happened? Absolutely. In fact, the more you clamp down on the church, the more it grows. And by the way, by the way, the, if you want to, historically, if you want to really mess the church up, then legalize the church. Did you know that? Did you hear that? I'm dead serious. The greatest, and in fact, the church has never fully recovered from this tactic of Satan's. Constantine legalized Christianity in the 300s and declared it as Rome's official religion. And the church became extremely weak, extremely deluded, and persecution ceased, and the church got very lazy. And it started to embrace other doctrines of Romanism, Babylonianism, and we've never fully recovered. If it wasn't for revivals that God sprinkles throughout church history, well, I think revivals through the word of God is what keeps Jesus' promise to all of us going. The gates of hell will not prevail. The church has grown. I'm not talking big seats. I'm not quite sure what that has ever accomplished. I'm talking about more and more people being converted to Jesus. And I'm happy, as you know, to report that in China and in the Islamic world, people are coming to Christianity, coming to Christ at breakneck speed and volume. It is awesome. It is absolutely awesome. It's sad in the West we're seeing a decline, but hey, that's okay. It's okay with me. Uh, I happen to be an American, but not for long. I mean, I'm going to get, you know, raptured or die. And uh, no one up there in heaven, you know, Peter's not going to be at the gate saying, Jack, you know, got your passport? Is that your picture or what? <laughs> not going to be an issue. You and I are of the political or politic of heaven. And I'm happy to hear that there's some, as far as they know, a known amount of some 1,500 Muslims converting to Christianity in the world being discipled. I don't know how they know that. I don't know who's doing that. But if that's what they know of, imagine how many they don't know of. Not to mention those that are coming to Christ in China, as I said. Now, that's the encouragement. But here comes a word of warning. Verse 32. And becomes a tree, or like a tree, or takes on the appearance of a tree. This is huge. This is massive. Okay, so here's the warning. There, listen, church. There is ministry growth that is God-produced, watch, both in the positive, or it could be positive, yes, of course, if God's doing it, but... Ministry growth doesn't necessarily mean it's a positive. If God's doing it, praise the Lord. But look at my, look, ministry growth, quote, quote, right, doesn't indicate that God's in it. Oh, look how big it is. God must be in it. Watch out. Ministry growth by God could be big or small. But we're so goofy people. Because in our psychology, a crowd draws a crowd. Oh, what's going on over there? Come on. I don't know. What is it? Let's go see. Come on. <laughs> We're like that. And how many people attend a church and they're going, what's going on? I don't know. I don't know, but what's happening? And then they walk out of church. What went on in there? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> but it's a crowd and it's very electric. <laughs> yeah, but what's happening? Uh, I don't know. This is happening. I mean, you can go home, go on, turn on Christian television on a Sunday afternoon. And uh, if it wasn't so sad, it'd be funny. 
of what's being said. I mean, you want to you want to you want to test how your discernment is? How much how well do you know your Bible? We should do this sometime. We should have an afternoon service, turn on Christian TV on a Sunday afternoon on the screens, and when you hear false doctrine, raise your hand. We can have a game. Ning, 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 ning. Hey! Section three, what did you find over there? That guy just misquoted that verse and misapplied that verse. And you know, I'm not kidding. Last Sunday, I did that. Turned it on. Whoa! Whoa! One guy said, I'm not going to say his name. One guy said, if you're sick, if you're sick, you do not have the power of God in your life if you're sick. Think of that. That, imagine. Imagine, t- hey, excuse me, Paul the Apostle, you do not have the power of God in your life. <laughs> Paul suffered throughout his life with various physical ailments. Well, if, you don't, if you're not rich, God's not in your life. There's sin in your life if you're not rich. First of all, all the guys saying that are rich because it's the poor people giving their money to him. Right? So it's easy to talk like that. Think of that. Am I offending you? Did you get offended in that? Listen. It's a big deal. Growth can be dangerous. The great thing is if the word of God goes out, it scrubs anybody. If it's 10 people or 10,000 people, if the word's going out, it's like a big SOS pad. Save our soul. (laughs) It's very powerful. So listen, in our lives regarding big endings, I mean, is this not your passion? I pray it is. In fact, turn to 2 Timothy 4.1. All of us need to be focusing on this. 2 Timothy (laughs) 4.1. This is, uh, who knows? Man, these are crazy days. The world's coming unhinged. I I want 2 Timothy 4 happening in my life. Well, I say, Pastor Jake, you've been talking about the end. You've been talking about Jesus coming back for years. That's right. But uh, every year you're closer to dropping dead, so pay attention. <laughs> the Lord may not come back, but you will drop dead. So we're one year closer. So here's the deal. If Jesus doesn't rapture us tonight, uh, you could lay down tonight and rupture something. And so you want to be ready, Right? 2 Timothy 4, Paul says, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and teaching. Why? Well, because verse 3, the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, biblical teaching. But according to their own desires, because of, they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. And they will turn their ears away from the truth. Notice that, church. They had their ears toward the truth. But something got them, and they, they'll turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you, be watchful in all things, Endure afflictions, that means when bad stuff happens to us, it doesn't mean God doesn't love you or he left you. You understand that? I've got cancer. I got hit by a truck. Uh, I'm losing my job. God loves you. That doesn't change. It has nothing to do with his affection for you. Nothing. Do the work of an evangelist. Notice, you, you can't tonight say, well, I can't tell anybody about Jesus because I don't have the gift of evangelism. Every Christian is to tell people about Jesus. There are people specially equipped by God that are ridiculously effective at it. I mean, you know, you're not supposed to lust about stuff, right? But I, man, Greg Laurie stands up. Now, keep the verse on the screen because I'm, I'm going on a rabbit trail now. Greg Laurie stands up and reads a menu at a restaurant and people get saved. I can preach my heart out and nobody raises their hand. It's like, man. You know, have you ever felt, have you ever, have you ever, you know what I'm talking about, right? When you think, I should share with that person. And then the thought enters your mind. No, man, what if they don't accept Jesus? I'll just, I'll play it safe and not say anything. 
Listen, we're all supposed to tell people about Jesus. We're supposed to tell. As God gives opportunity, we're supposed to bear witness for Christ. Okay? And then when there's like big heavy lifting to be done, God brings in the Greg Lorries and the Billy Grahams and people that just have the gift of them. You, many of you, I've seen you on these mission trips. You're amazing. You're sharing with people. What are you laughing at? You're one of them. Robert, you. I just heard you make, make a noise. You're one of them. There's no, you can't get on the airplane. We've been all over the world. You can't get on the airplane with Robert without him. What's he doing up there? What's he doing up there? He's got the pilot in a corner. He's sharing Christ. And, you know, I mean, it's amazing. Now, we were somewhere. Um, do the work of evangelists, verse 5, fulfill your ministry, for I am all, listen to Paul, it's so precious, for I am already being poured out as a drink offering. I'm dying. God told me I'm going to die. And the time of my departure is at hand. Please underline that. Are you dying? Listen, the time of your departure is at hand. Did you hear me? The time of your departure is at hand. I don't want to go. Notice the, notice the verbiage. The time of your departure. What do you do before you go on a trip? What do you do before you go on a vacation? Pack. You pack. You get ready. Should I wear this? <laughs> right? I always wear black on a trip because I spill everything on me. So you're ready? Say, yeah, I'm ready. And you're excited. Let's go. Where are we going? Come on, let's go. Notice the, Paul says, my departure's at hand. He's like, boop, boop. Getting ready. He's not like, oh, I don't want to go. Christians. We read about heaven. We read about eternity. We read about Jesus. We talk to him all the time. And then the moment comes, our departure is at hand. I don't want to go. Think about it. What are we afraid of? We're, I'm, I'm, I don't want to go through the, the, the change part, <laughs> the death part. I understand that. And that's, by the way, a God-ordained witness. Humans create the image of God. Death is an abnormality. But thank God for the Christian. It's a momentary event. Paul says, my departure is at hand. I got my ticket. I'm dressed. You know what I mean by dressed, right? I've got the righteousness of Christ around me. I have the helmet of salvation on. I'm ready to go. Are you ready to go? Yes. If you're not ready to go, you, need, you can get ready to go right now as you listen. I love this. Verse 7, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I've kept the faith. This is what we are to end like Christian. And I have no jurisdiction over you ending this way. You have no jurisdiction over me ending this way. You must choose to determine tonight, that's how I'm going to end. I'm going to end like Paul. You have to decide that tonight. Some of you tonight are saying, Who, I don't really care. Okay, some of you are saying tonight, I want that. Then listen, if you want that, God will never disappoint you. He will see to it. Yeah, well, what about me who I don't want it? Then you won't have it. <laughs> right? You don't want, what's he, he's not going to give you something that you don't want. Third and final thing, it's a quick ending though, it's, it's, we're done, and that, and that is the mustard seed. Notice this, constant care is required. Why? It says there, verse 32, so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. The birds of the air, this is the interesting thing, listen, the birds, as I said earlier, are not good, generically speaking. Well, so then why are they there? A lot of reasons the Bible warns us to infiltrate the body, to bring false doctrine, to disrupt people's faith, to sow discord among the brethren, to mess people up, to cast, put doubt in your minds. They're everywhere. Where, listen, wherever God is working, birds will be flocking.
And Jesus issues a warning. And he said that earlier in Matthew 13, 4 and Matthew 13, 19. He, in both cases, he said the birds are bad, not good. They devour the word, they take it away. And so what I want you to focus on, constant care, Christian, in thinking about this, all of you, now look, I know many of you on, on these Wednesday nights, you attend other churches on Sunday, and that's fine, that's great. When you go back to your other churches and serve or minister or whatever you do, you need to go on to your church campus next Sunday with, with a different set of eyes. Yes, there's a pastor and staff, and there's, I understand that, but you are a Christian, and the church is a living, breathing organism. And when you go to your church next Sunday, you need, can I put it this way? Please understand me. You need to own it. And what I mean by that is this. Don't go to a church and be comfortable or settled as a spectator there. You need to go there and care for it. You need to go there and love it. You need to go there and ask Jesus, Lord, this is my church where you've called me for the season of my life. And Lord, use me to make a difference. And look, that doesn't mean you have to sign up for some ministry. It could simply mean this, which I tell you what, I would appreciate this, is if you just walked around with a sweet spirit, don't get me wrong, but you're very conscious and very aware, you know what, I love my church and I want to protect my church. And, uh, you know, there's a guy over there, what's he doing over there? Scratching those cars with the car keys <laughs> or something. <laughs> I went to a church one time, that's what happened to me. Parked my car. <laughs> Some guys, what? And I thought, man, what is this? Satan must go to this church. <laughs> but care for it. And walking down the hallway, and, and you know, there's, a, there's some trash in the, in the, in the hallway. And look, look if, you, if, you're not, if you're not committed, you're going to walk by and you're going to go, man, pff, this church needs to hire people. <laughs> <laughs> but listen, God took your eyeballs and let you see the trash on the floor. And you know what? You were judging the church, and God was judging you. Because you walk by and go, what a filthy place. <laughs> and God was saying to you, why don't you pick it up? Be a servant, will you? The church needs constant care, let alone doctrine, theology, the hurts and pains, the brokenness of families and lives, illnesses, sickness, death, babies being born, constant stuff. Constant. It's absolutely crazy amazing. We begin with a little bit of faith. God's word, Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. And your faith goes like this. Your faith starts like this. I believe. And you eat some Bible, and you eat more Bible, and you get bigger, and your faith gets stronger, and it's like, yes! Until faith, you know, listen, faith is just exploding out of you, and you've got now to respond to what God has done. It's very exciting. And so we're all to be on the same page Jesus is warning us, watch out for those birds. <laughs> watch out for a bird attack. Because they're everywhere where God is moving. So the kingdom of heaven in a nutshell is going to grow, 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 grow. That's fantastic, but be careful because there's going to be the infiltration of the enemy to try to lodge in its branches. The church is not a company. It's not a club. It's not an auxiliary it's not a rotary. It is a spiritual institution created by God and it is altogether separate from the governments of this world. And that drives the governments of this world crazy because God is our king and Jesus is our Christ. Amen. Father, we thank you for your word and for your truth, Lord. We pray. Father, we pray we lift up this church to you. Lord, the truth is, all of us are just passing through. 
And even if you don't come back for a hundred years, everyone in this room will be with you before that ever happens. Who cares if it's a hundred years or a hundred minutes? We're going to be with you. Lord, there'll come a time that if you don't come, this church will be pastored by another pastor and there'll be different worship people here and there'll be different people sitting in the congregation and the only thing standing around temporarily will be the walls. The challenge to us tonight is what condition will we leave this church into the hands of others? What will we be handing the baton And what will it be like? So Father, we pray tonight as a body of believers to keep us on the straight and narrow. Lord, this church is certainly bigger than what we started with six people. Protect us from birds lodging in the branches. Help us to find them and flush them out and do whatever is necessary. But Father, we pray tonight that faith would be alive in us. And if there's anyone here tonight that does not know that amazing nucleus within their soul, the Holy Spirit, then tonight, my friend, whoever you may be, if you're not sure if you died today, that you'd go to heaven. If you still feel the anchor of your sin upon your ankles and Tonight, the Holy Spirit is speaking to you saying, be free now. Repent of those sins. That is, give them to Christ. Tell him about it. Don't hide it. Bring it right up to the front. Bring it right up to the surface and say, Jesus, I need to be forgiven of these sins. I know it's wrong. And I believe you died on the cross for my sins and that you rose again from the grave for my justification. And I right now, tonight, today, wherever you are in the world watching this right now, you're saying, I'm putting my faith in Jesus Christ. I'm going to follow him from this moment on. God will change your life. We give our lives to you tonight, Lord. And we worship you in spirit and in truth even now. In Jesus' name.